News contributor Rick Green. Rick, uh, so much is being made about this uh, this shooting. It was tragic because of where it is and because of the riots. I did a little research. Um, about 10 million plus or minus arrest every year, and of those 10 million, about 1,000 end fatally. Uh, the numbers aren't what it seems to be. Yeah, you're actually doing exactly what Martin Luther King Jr. told us we all should do if we're going to consider protest. Uh, the number one step in his letter from the Birmingham jail was that you gather the facts to make sure there is an injustice. That's first. And then you try to negotiate. And then you have self-purification to make sure that you're acting Christ-like, as he put it, when you go out and protest. And at that point, then you take direct action. Boy, there's a lot of steps there that have been skipped completely over the last year. And if we just did the first step, just the first step of actually investigating, looking at the facts, making sure there's an injustice before people start rioting, which they shouldn't be rioting in the first place, MLK would have never been for that. Um, if we would just do investigation and if we had leaders in all of these movements that would call for that instead of, uh, frankly, encouraging people to take to the streets, then we could solve a lot of this. Most of these instances, even if you go back to Michael Brown, uh, when you actually do the investigation, they're justified on the police officers. Uh, the actions of the police officer are, are absolutely justified in most of these cases. Of course, there's going to be the aberration. Of course, there's going to be the exception to the rule. And it appears at this point that this would be an exception to the rule, that the officer clearly made a mistake. But even in this case, we cannot forget this guy was trying to flee arrest. If you don't run from the cops, if you don't break free from the cops and go back into your car where they don't even know if you're grabbing a weapon or not and then trying to drive off, if you don't do those things, then this type of thing doesn't happen. And we've got to start teaching our entire country that lesson first and we'll be able to avoid these incidents. Right. She was uh, 26 years on the force. Was uh, Actually, I've been told she was doing training at the moment of uh, this arrest. You can hear her call taser, taser, taser. I'm in no way um, minimizing the death of this young man. That's horrible. Nobody wants that. But it makes sense to me that if you continue to call for defunding the police and drawing down the numbers of police, we'll get less and less quality officers. Am I wrong? Well, certainly we'll get more and more mistakes, even with quality officers, because the defunding the police continues to put more and more pressure on the police that stick around. I mean, we know we've seen a mass exodus from the police force, unfortunately, because of the, frankly, unfounded attacks on every officer in America. Uh, I am so tired of watching these young white liberals come out of these universities and, and spit in the face of a black police officer and call them a racist. Those types of things that have happened over the last year, we've demoralized our police force. And these are people that are putting their lives on the line for us. They're willing to die for us. And in every situation, they have to get it 100% right. Split second decisions every day that they're faced with. And so, you know, look, I mean, we're making their job virtually impossible. And uh, this is where we need leadership from mayors and governors stepping up uh, to have a rational approach to this. Let's not forget what happened in Minneapolis. I still blame all the rioting across the country um, mostly on Jacob Fry, the mayor that said, let them burn the police station. And the minute he did that, he told the rest of the nation, it's OK to riot without doing what MLK said, having an investigation to make sure there's injustice, then negotiate, then self-purification and then take direct action. We need to go back to the letter from the Birmingham jail. That's absolutely so true. Thank you for bringing that up. And we can't forget, we announced it yesterday, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter has just invested a whole lot of money into very expensive properties. Tim. Greg, in an effort to help slow the migrants crossing the United States southern border, the Biden administration announced Monday it had come to agreements with Mexico, Honduras, and Guatemala. The deal involves an increased military presence along each country's southern border to stem the flow of migrants heading north to the United States. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said Mexico was committing 10,000 troops along its border with Guatemala and that Guatemala will do the same with 1,500 troops on its border with Honduras. Meantime, Honduras has agreed to step up 12 checkpoints along the migratory route north. Greg? Okay. South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster is stepping up to make sure that children in foster care are his state's first priority. 
The governor signed an executive order that would prohibit the federal government from sending unaccompanied minors from the U.S.-Mexico border to South Carolina. The move comes as the Department of Health and Human Services is beginning to inquire whether individual states, foster care systems are equipped to handle placement of unaccompanied children. McMaster's office added that federal government's plan would create a plan to financially incentivize private providers in the short term to the extent that these facilities can prioritize, listen to this, prioritize the placement of unaccompanied migrant children over the placement of South Carolinian children. Well, Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton is making sure that money earmarked for Americans actually stays with Americans. Senator Cotton introduced a bill that would penalize states that support sending funds from the American Re Rescue Plan to illegal immigrants. In a statement, Cotton said that the government shouldn't be subsidizing state efforts to send cash to illegal immigrants. The bill would require states to certify that they are not offering federal funds to anyone in the country illegally. Greg? All right, I want to bring in Texas State Representative Matt Kraus, who represents the 93rd District. Representative Kraus, thank you for joining us today. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. Well, we heard news now that the border is going to be secured down below us, down below Mexico, that Mexico and Guatemala are going to take the lead in this. Uh, we still haven't seen the president or the vice president here in the state of Texas or Arizona. I haven't missed it, have I? Uh, you know, I, I guess uh, President Biden is taking cues from the last Democrat uh, president that we had, Barack Obama, in leading from behind. So uh, I guess we're going to let all those other countries uh, secure their borders first before we do that. But um, I'm glad they're making that decision. Uh, and, and that's something that the Trump administration had actually worked on with these countries um, to, to stop the, the tide of uh, immigrants surging at our borders. And so I think uh, what these other countries are doing is going to help us here in Texas and in the country, but uh, we, we've got to get the border under control. Yeah, we had a colleague of yours on yesterday, Representative King, and he was talking about the expense that this is costing the state of Texas, something that you haven't budgeted for as you're working there in the, the legislature. How do we overcome this? That's right. Uh, you're exactly right. And, and this is one of the areas the federal government seems to do things that they're not supposed to do all the time. Here we actually have something that they're tasked to do and asked to do, and they're not doing it. And so it is very frustrating that uh, Texas is often, um, when we have these uh, administrations that don't seem to have a strong or coherent border um, strategy that we're, we end up having to pay for that. But we, we need to, right? Uh, I would say Texas has the responsibility uh, to make sure its citizens are protected as much as possible. Um, and also there's a humanitarian aspect to this. You think about all these migrant children who have come over, they've endured a long trip, they've faced treacherous uh, conditions the whole way here. And then when they get here, they're in these facilities. It's amazing when it's a Democrat administration, the media calls them uh, detention facilities. When Republican administrations are there, they're called kids in cages. But we have these detention facilities that are overrun. These kids are packed in there, and that's not healthy for them either. So it's not just uh, costing Texas money, but it's costing lives. And from a humanitarian perspective, that's something we should all be frustrated with. You heard that story. We were talking about the South Carolina governor, Henry McMaster, not allowing these the uh, these new children that have come into the country to jump over the line of children that are in the foster care system there in his state. You think that anything like that would uh, be proposed there in the Texas legislature? Uh, you know, that's that's uh, something we could look at. Uh, again, it's just a terrible situation. I feel for these kids, to be honest with you, uh, uh, separated from their parents in a situation they don't really know where they're at. Um, but, but I understand where Governor McMaster's is coming from as well. Uh, we've got a lot of foster care adoption possibilities, opportunities here in Texas. Uh, I hope we continue to focus on that. Um, but again, I, I, I actually feel terrible for these uh, migrant children. Uh, we need to be praying for them. Uh, uh, the, the private sector, the churches, the nonprofits need to be helping them any way we can. But as a government, we have to have a border and we have to have a secure border, which means we need to make the decisions that, that enforce that. Matt, that was such an intelligent answer. Thank you for that, because that's exactly what we did in our history before when Saigon fell. 
uh, the president reached out, President Ford at that time, reached out to the churches and the faith-based communities, and they began then finding homes uh, for that children. Great answer on that. You're absolutely right. Mike, nice. over to you. Greg Freshman, Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia has some explaining to do after lending his signature to an email containing misinformation about Georgia's new voting laws. Warnock signed the email that was sent out by the liberal advocacy group 3.14 Action. In the email, several incorrect claims were made about Georgia's SB202 bill, including elimination of no excuse mail in voting and restrictions of early voting on the weekends. A spokesperson for the senator has reportedly said that Warnock approved the text of the email at a time when these provisions were still being considered. In respect to a big business working together, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley shared a tweet from CBS News Ed O'Keefe over the weekend who revealed that a Zoom call was held on Saturday by more than 100 leaders of the most powerful corporations in America to reportedly discuss how to combat future election integrity laws like the one in Georgia. And called out by the conservative clergy of color, a group of black pastors and ministers announced on Monday they were publishing a full page ad in the Atlanta Journal Constitution newspaper entitled Stop Lying. The group says the ad is being used to call out the lies being told about the Georgia Election Integrity Act of 2021 by both President Joe Biden and former gubernatorial candidate Democrat Stacey Abrams. The ad points to the messaging about the new law by both Biden and Abrams as the reason Major League Baseball pulled its all-star game from Atlanta. The game was expected to bring $100 million to the local economy, much of that going to minority business owners. And now the ad reads in part, lie. The new law restricts early voting. Truth, the law expands early voting hours and additional weekend voting opportunities, including Sundays. Lie, voter ID requirements are racially discriminatory. Truth, IDs are necessary for numerous everyday activities, and the law even lets voters use documents like utility bills instead of state-issued IDs. The Speaker of the House, California Representative Nancy Pelosi, is not holding back any punches in a new book calling out members of the squad in particular, spectacular fashion rather, in the upcoming book called Madam Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Lessons of Power. The author says that Pelosi adopted a childlike tone when calling out progressive Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and other members of the squad, saying that, quote, you're not a one person show. This is the Congress of the United States. The book is based on more than 150 exclusive interviews, as well as in-depth interviews with the speaker herself. Well, Project Veritas has done it again. This time, James O'Keefe and friends have a CNN director on tape. Listen to this, admitting to helping get Donald Trump out of office. Let's listen. Look what we did. We got Trump out. I am 100% going to say it. And I 100% believe it that if it wasn't for saying that, I don't know that Trump would have got voted out. Our focus was to get Trump out of office, right? Without saying it, that's what it was, right? So our next thing is going to be for climate change awareness. Do you think it's going to be just like a lot of like fear? Like climate? Yeah, fear sells. Fear sells. No one ever says it, those things out loud, but it's obvious. For years, We've heard that CNN is the most trusted name in news, but a CNN director is on tape telling us that they're propaganda, helping a certain political candidate, employees admitting what we've always known to be true. Trump uh, was, uh, I, I don't know, like his hand was shaking or whatever like that. We brought in like so many medical people to like all tell a story that like it was all speculation. That he was like neurological damage, like that, that he was losing it, he's unfit to, you know, whatever. We were. We were creating a story there that we didn't know anything about, you know. Now, Tim, prior to the clip you heard right there, that director from CNN was said, said they put video up of Joe Biden jogging to make him seem younger and fitter. And they also put video up of Joe, Bi Joe Biden in aviator glasses to make him look kind of cool. So incredible. Just once again, Project Veritas coming through with the truth, 
truth that we need to hear. Tim. Wow, well, Mark, that's, how, that's astounding, astounding. Fear sells, but it doesn't sell here on the Victory Channel, so remember that. Missouri Senator Josh Hawley set his sights on Big Tech Monday with his latest legislative initiative. The Republican introduced what he is calling the Trust Busting for the 21st Century Act. In Hawley's press release about the bill, he said, quote, a small group of woke mega corporations control the products Americans can buy, the information Americans can receive, and the speech Americans can engage in. Boy, is that the truth. These yeah. monopoly powers control our speech, our economy, our country, and their control has only grown because Washington has aided and abetted their quest for endless power. The bill would place bans on mergers and acquisitions by companies with a market cap of over $100 billion, among other things. Greg. All right, former President Donald Trump came out over the weekend and said his confident that the Republicans will win back both houses in 2022 and the White House in 24. Mr. Trump made the predictions at a gathering in Florida of Republican donors in an interview with Newsmax. Trump aide Jason Miller said the former president will not be shy about going after Joe Biden on his seemingly failed policies on the border, along with the corporate cancel culture. I want to bring Rick Green in here. We've known it. We've all experienced it. You heard it there with Project Veritas, cancel culture. They are all working together to create the narrative. And this is why, this is, to be honest with you, it's why Victory News has grown to the level it has since this all happened. It's part of the reason Victory News is so important. People have to do a better job of seeking truth. They've got to find good outlets. They've got to find sources that they can count on, and Victory certainly is one of those. And I love what Tim said a second ago, that fear doesn't sell on this channel because we believe that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power to love and a sound mind. And watching shows like this is what helps you get that sound mind. It gives you the reason, the logic, the data, the facts, so that you can make good decisions. And what a difference it makes. And, and I got to tell you guys, man, I run into people all over the country that say, hey, I saw you on Victory. I saw you on Victory. Y'all are reaching so many people. I thank God for what you're doing. Well, thank you. And thank you for being part of it. You bring the level of expertise up. I appreciate it. I want to go to Representative Krauss real quick. The um, Dr. Fauci today talked about the, uh, the CDC and pulling back the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. What impact has that had on the state of Texas and our preparedness? Yeah, and it, that's a great question. First of all, I want to go back with what my really good friend Rick Green said earlier in the program about uh, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. If you've got kids that are in public school, private school, homeschool, old enough that they're out of school and out of your home, make them read that letter. We could all use a refresher on the best way to handle adversity uh, and, and the kind of turmoil that our country's going through. Dr. Martin Luther King had a brilliant message. Um, and I, I just want to echo uh, Rick's message that everybody needs to read that letter from a Birmingham jail. Uh, getting to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, Governor Abbott put out a statement today, because there are some issues, Texas has temporarily halted the use of Johnson & Johnson. He's still encouraging everyone to get the uh, Moderna or the Pfizer vaccines, but because there were a few rare cases, none of them in Texas yet that we know of, they have uh, been proactive in uh, suspended the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine here in Texas. So um, that's kind of where we stand until more things come out about it, but that, that's what the governor uh, has put out today. Okay, thank you so much for that. Mike, let's pitch this back to you. Greg, China said it firmly opposes the new guidelines unveiled by the United States State Department on official contacts with Taiwan. The communist regime warned the new U.S. policy may bring subversive impact on the bilateral relations and the peace and the stability of the Taiwan Strait. The department announced the change policy in a statement that said the Biden administration intends to liberalize the rules to reflect the deepening unofficial relationship between the United States and Taiwan. However, the revised guidelines don't include all the changes put in place by former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in the waning days of the Trump administration. Pompeo had lifted virtually all restrictions on contacts with Taiwan, including allowing Taiwanese military officers to wear uniforms and display the Taiwanese flag at meetings with U.S. officials. Well, Joe Biden has nominated a former Obama Defense Department official to be Secretary of the Army. The president made the announcement about Christine Wormuth on Monday. Now, if confirmed, Wormuth will be the first woman to hold that post. 
Warmoff uh, was the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy under President Obama. Now, according to the White House, she presently serves as director of the International Security and Defense Policy Center at the RAND Corporation. Well, Japan's government decided Tuesday to start releasing treated radioactive water from the wrecked Fukushima nuclear plant into the Pacific Ocean in two years' time. Now, the option is fiercely opposed by fishermen, residents, and Japan's neighbors. The decision was long speculated, but delayed for years due to safety concerns and protests. It came at a meeting of cabinet ministers who endorsed the ocean release as the best option. The accumulating water has been stored in tanks at the Fukushima plant there since 2011, when a massive earthquake and tsunami damaged its reactors, and their cooling water became contaminated and began leaking. The plant's storage capacity will be full late next year. Well, we're finally hearing some rumblings about that Durham investigation. The New York Times reported on Monday that the federal prosecutor has subpoenaed records from the Brookings Institute involving the Trump-Russia dossier, also known as the Steele dossier. John Durham reportedly is investigating the trail of the dossier. Now, according to the Times, Durham subpoenas are targeting records of one of Brookings' former analysts, who was a main source for former British spy Christopher Steele. The name of that analyst is reportedly a Russian by the name of Igor Dechenko. Greg, back to you. All right. Uh, Rick Green, I want to bring you in on this. Hollywood rarely gets it right, but when I was listening to that Japan story this morning for the first time, I thought, wait a minute, I've seen this movie. You release nuclear wastewater into the ocean, you get Godzilla. Am I wrong? <laughs> well, we'll find out in a few months, won't we? Yeah. So, <laughs> leave it to you to bring Godzilla into this. That's amazing. That's, well, a, that's I, a pretty good transition, Greg. I'm impressed. I just had to throw you a, a curveball. Let me get your thoughts about what we're hearing with the dossier. We're finally uh, maybe going to get some resolution on this. Yeah, you know, who knows? I mean, I, I, I think we're all so frustrated with uh, the federal level of being able to stop anyone from being corrupt. I mean, we, we saw it all the way back in the Clinton years. And since that time, it just seems like uh, situation after situation after situation, everybody gets away with whatever they want in Washington, D.C. It's part of the reason the American people are frustrated. We feel like we have a two-tier justice system because we do have a two-tier justice system right now. I am so thankful for those pastors in Georgia mm -hmm. uh, willing to take out these ads to yeah. step up and say, hey, let's start getting this right. This uh, this election integrity law is a good thing. Um, you know, they're basically saying to all of these corporate entities that are trying to say that these laws trying to, you know, strengthen our election uh, system are racist. And these guys, these guys are saying, hey, we're the black pastors of Georgia and we're telling you this is a good thing and it needs to happen. So when citizens at the state level step up like that, we're going to be able to push back on a lot of this craziness, including these investigations that seem to go nowhere. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you, Rick Green, for your analysis on all that. I also want to thank uh, Matt Krause. Matt, thank you for, for being on with us today. And I said this yesterday, when you find, to everybody across America, when you find a good representative like Matt Krause and you find one in your area, support them yeah. and thank them and help them. And Matt, thank you so very much. Uh, for what you do here in the state of Texas. God bless you, sir, uh, in, in all you. you're doing. Uh, I also want to thank you for joining us today. And I have one uh, very special announcement before I talk about